Hi, I'm Kelly Corrigan, and I'm sitting next to Russell Banks. Hi, welcome. Hi, Kelly. So great to have you here. It's so great to be here. So, personally, I want to talk about how you wanted to run away and support Fidel Castro, and I also want to hear about your time as a plumber mm -hmm. and a little bit about your toy school bus collection. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're supposed to talk about is your work as a writer. Probably, yeah. Um, <laughs> To, you write both short stories and novels. I wonder how you come to decide uh, which to do mm. with any given mm. idea. Well, actually, it doesn't have to do necessarily with a given idea. Um, it has to do with what I've just finished. And, and as much as uh, generally what I've done after writing a novel is want to write short stories simply because uh, I want to use a different aspect of my brain, mm -hmm. a different part of my imagination and engage with writing in a, in a way that allows the rest of my brain to kind of recover itself. Yeah, it's like clearing uh, your cache yes, or something. Yes, absolutely. Or the it, runner it, that yeah. starts swimming for yeah, a while. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Use different mental muscles, uh, because you do use very different mental muscles in writing short stories. It's a much closer to, it isn't that they're just shorter than a novel, it's also a different relation to, invokes a different relation to language and to structure and form. And uh, it's much closer, I think, in some ways to writing lyric poetry or, or writing music uh, mm -hmm. than, it, than it is to, uh, to writing long fiction novels. Have you ever written either of those things, lyrical poetry or music? Poetry, yes. Uh, in fact, I began as a poet. I thought I was a poet for a while. And, uh, you have the look. I'm I, <laughs> I would buy it. Yeah, you would? Yeah. OK. Uh, I tried, and I was, I, I, I was good enough to know I didn't really have the gift. Uh -huh. And I also had very good friends. My first friends as a writer when I was very young in my 20s, early 20s and teens, were real poets. I mean, they were good, and they remained good, and they still are. People like Charles Simmett and William Matthews and, sure. and so forth, and James Tate. These were my first literary friendships, and they were with people that I said, I don't Whatever they have, I don't right. think I have. It's a wonder you yeah. didn't throw the towel in completely with friends like that. I mean, I think that could be very intimidating, <laughs> yeah, right? It was, yes. It's amusing. It's a little side story here. Uh, a few weeks ago, I got a note from a man who was retiring from his job at the University of Arizona, and he was going through his desk, and he found he had edited a literary magazine back in the 60s, and uh, he found a manuscript that I had submitted to him of oh, poems how that great. I had submitted. And, and horrifying. He, and, and he still had it. That yeah. was the thing. And he was really <laughs> apologetic because he hadn't sent it back to me. And he did send it back to me, including the rejection slip that he had never sent to me. And the rejection slip was so kind. It said, I'm sorry, Mr. Banks, we can't use these poems, but I wonder if you've ever thought of writing prose fiction. <laughs> right on. He had your number he from the get-go. He had my number in the 1968. So yes, I had thought of it, and I did indeed continue to write prose fiction. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me this. I'm sure you've thought through this long and hard over the years, but what do you think the job of writing is? I, uh, it's, a, it's social behavior, I mean, it, uh, of the most intimate sort. Um, I don't think of it as a job. I think of it as a relationship that one bears to other human beings, strangers meaning, uh, but to the species almost. And, and the main job, is, uh, or the main task, let's put it that way, for the writer in the tribe is to really clarify for the rest of the tribe what it is to be human, for mm -hmm. better or worse. I mm -hmm. mean, our ange angelic side and, and our evil side. Um, are uh, um, all aspects of what it is to be human. You know, we're, as a species, we're the only species that has to learn over and over and over again what it is to be itself. Mm -hmm. Every other species knows immediately what it is to be a horse, what it is to be a dog, mm -hmm. what it is to be anything, a lichen. We don't know <laughs> what it is to be human until our artists tell us and show us what yeah. it is to be human. That's why we keep on returning to our artists. That's why we keep on having to renew our artists. Yeah. So one of the things that you shine light on and, and are trying to figure out about what it is to be human, I think, is the classes and the barriers between them and, and what we're doing to each other by putting each other in these buckets. I guess so. And the power of, of economics, the power of class to shape mm -hmm. our minds and our, and our relationships and our politics and our understandings of, of, of the world that surrounds us. Um, yeah, the class keeps coming back again and again. I, I, I have a hard time seeing human activity without considerations of class, mm -hmm. just as I would have a hard time seeing human activity without considerations of race, at least if it's Americans. Right. Uh, 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 
human activity, mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. anywhere across the planet. And, and I have a hard time seeing human activity without consideration of place, of geography, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the depths and layers of, of history that, that, that surrounds us. So class is certainly one of them that I do come back to, yes. And do you th find that when you look at class today in 2014, going into 2015, that it's worse than it's ever been, the, well, the problems yeah, with the it? The gap between the haves and the have-nots is greater. The numbers, too, of the haves uh, compared to the have-nots have changed. The real proportions have changed right. dramatically in my lifetime. I mean, I'm now old enough so that I have a pretty sharp, I still have a sharp enough memory, I yeah. should say, of, you know, of a world uh, uh, almost uh, more than half a century ago. I remember the 1940s and 50s and 60s, and, and it was a dramatically different world in terms of economics uh, in mm -hmm. the United States uh, than, than it is now. The world for my children and grandchildren is very different than the world some ways very good it's better I have four daughters so for them it's a better world today uh -huh. and, and I and I and I have a black grandson and so for him it's a better world today than yeah. it was in yep. my childhood so I'm aware of those shifts but um, in, a, in a positive sense and but I'm also aware of dramatic shifts economically in mm -hmm. class wise too. Mm -hmm. do you have um, a great teacher in your past that you want to give a shout out to Actually, I do, but he's dead. That's all right. That's, <laughs> he has relatives. Surely he has relatives. Yeah, no, the, the great novelist, uh, now not as well known as he was in the 1950s and 60s, Nelson Algren, the Chicago writer, uh, was a mentor for me. Um, he uh, and I uh, met each other when I was 22 years old, I think, 23 years old. And um, Where and were you when you were 23? I was working as a plumber in uh, Concord, New Hampshire. I knew we could get to that you, plumber you thing. You got to the plumber thing that way. Right? I mean, how many plumber writers are there? <laughs> I don't know. Not that many, I don't Maybe think. Maybe more than you think, yeah. actually. But uh, my father was a plumber. My grandfather was a plumber, so I kind of slid into it. And, um, and uh, I went, uh, I, I saw an ad for Bread Loaf Writers Conference, which uh, was up in Vermont. I had no idea what a writers conference was. But I sent them a manuscript of a novel. They gave me a little fellowship, so I drove up to Vermont. And Nelson Algren, the reason I did this was because Nelson Algren was on the staff. And he was a novelist I just admired above all others at that time. And he read my novel, and, and he said, um, he did the best thing any writer teacher can do is he said, this is a really good page here, kid. And there's some great dialogue on this page. And he would leaf through it. And he said, now, this is a nice little passage here, kid. And said, <laughs> now you got to write a whole book that's right. as good as those pieces. Right. But then he said exactly. the thing, most right important thing was that he said, but don't worry, kid, you got it. Oh. And this is the laying on of the hands and the giving permission uh -huh. to, to a young kid like me um, was really crucial, absolutely crucial. Oh, he didn't do the editing, he didn't do the blue penciling or fix no. it, you know, like a workshop might yeah. try to do. It was just simply, you have permission. These are the good parts. Yes. There are good parts. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, I have someone like that in my life yeah. who says, yes, this will be a great book someday. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do in 2015? What great thing? What gift are you going to give uh, us all oh, next I'm, year? Yeah, I'm trying to write a book that I have a hard time describing because it isn't clear to me yet what it is, the, the shape that it's taking. It's nonfiction, however, which I've never done before in this sense. It's, a, um, it's sort of a travel memoir, a book that's about all the places in the world that I've traveled, but it's also a memoir and uh, full of memories and reflections and digressions and mm -hmm. self-analysis um, and confessions and Fantastic. so forth. Fantastic. But it's, it's framed by travel. And because uh -huh. uh, I've, I've, in the Andes and in the, in the Himalayas and, and um, West Africa and uh, Middle East and so forth. And, and and so are you a journal keeper? Like, do you have all little bits and pieces of this already scribbled yes. out somewhere that you need to somehow stitch together? Right, right. Mm -hmm. I'm working with, with uh, notes and sketches and materials and, and even some essays that I've written in the past and trying to pull everything together and make it into a kind of book I've never written before. Great. I well, we can't so. wait to read it. Thank <laughs> you so much for coming by. Thank you, Kelly. International is brought to you by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation in association with PBS Digital Studios.
I just challenge you to go through the book fair and not find something that you're interested in. One of the things I love about the book fair is it is a cornucopia of opportunity. You can literally find any kind of literary discipline you're interested in. You can see your favorite author. You can see somebody you've never heard of. But when they all get together, there's a synergy that begins to happen. Knight Foundation, proud sponsor of PBS's coverage of the Miami Book Fair International.